Um, I heard about the plague outbreak in India a few years ago. I mean, is this the same plague that could be used as a VW agent? Absolutely, Doris. Uh, plague uh, is caused by the gram-negative uh, rod, Yersinia pestis. Uh, it's uh, uh, an organism of great historical importance. It was, uh, uh, it's an organism that has this bipolar safety pin staining. You can see that here uh, on the slide. Uh, in fact, it has a long history as a biological weapon. It was probably the first recorded uh, biological weapon. In 1346, uh, a group of Tatar invaders were besieging the city of Kaffa, now known as Theodosia in Ukrainian Crimea. Uh, and holed up within this city of Kaffa were a bunch of Genoese merchants. Well, the plague struck the Tatar invaders outside the city. Uh, and in frustration, I guess, they hit upon uh, the somewhat clever idea of catapulting the dead bodies of their fellow soldiers over the walls into the city of Kaffa in an attempt uh, to institute a plague epidemic within Kaffa. And uh, it worked. Uh, the Genoese merchants inside the city got the plague. Uh, they panicked. They fled the city, got in their boats, uh, sailed back to Italy, took the plague uh, with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and from there, the rest is history. That's how the Black Death got its foothold uh, in continental Europe. We now know uh, that maybe this catapulting of bodies really wasn't the real reason for the plague epidemic within the city. We now know that plague is uh, transmitted by fleas. The fleas are carried by rats. Uh, fleas tend to leave a body as soon as it cools a degree or mm -hmm. two. And so, in, in all likelihood, the bodies that were flung over the walls of Kaffa probably weren't infectious. And the real reason people inside the city got the plague was the rats right. uh, burrowed uh, in and out of the city. Um, in addition to this uh, problem in Kaffa, or this uh, use in Kaffa, uh, we know that the Japanese uh, in the years prior to World War II, had a unit uh, known as Battalion 731, or Unit 731. Uh, and they did uh, experiments in occupied Manchuria with uh, probably 20 different pathogens, uh, and included amongst those uh, was plague. All right. Well, we now have Colonel Russ Byrne, Chief of Bacteriology at USAMRID, with us today. He's going to assist us in discussing the plague. Welcome, Colonel Byrne. Thank you. Uh, don't we have plague in this country, too? Plague arrived in San Francisco in 1899 as part of the third pandemic. It uh, kind of settled in the southwestern states of this country, northern uh, New Mexico and Arizona in the Four Corners area. This country averages about 10 cases of plague per year. There are much larger outbreaks in other areas of the world. I, I think the, the first two pandemics are worth mentioning, mm -hmm. too, because they're, they're interesting. Uh, the first pandemic of plague was known as the Plague of Justinian. Uh, and again, this is a, an organism with uh, historical uh, features that are, that are somewhat unprecedented and fascinating. Um, the plague of Justinian was probably responsible for putting the final nail in the coffin of the Byzantine Empire back in the 500s. And then the second pandemic of plague was that great black death that swept through Europe uh, that involved or that emanated from this incident in Kaffa. And how so, long does a pandemic last? Well, a pandemic uh, can last hundreds of years. And in fact, as Colonel Byrne uh, alluded to, we're in the third global pandemic mm. of plague right now. All right. Well, Craig Levy, an epidemiologist with the Arizona Department of Public Health, has many years of experience with plague out there. So let's listen to him talk about the source of the bacteria in this country. What you tend to see in plague in nature is you have the plague cycling amongst rodent populations through flea bites. Rodents get plague. Many of the rodents die of plague. Fleas move on to other rodents. Uh, what you see here as a flea uh, literally embedding his mouth parts and sucking blood from a, uh, from a potential victim. If that flea had taken a blood meal from an infected rodent, that flea would have a chance to have the bacteria multiply in its gut, in foregut, in proventriculus, and in the process of feeding can regurgitate uh, literally thousands of bacteria into the bite wound. Uh, this is a flea here that has uh, just taken a blood meal from a rodent. And that big red spot you see in the abdomen is the blood meal that he, uh, that he took in. When they do suck a blood meal, they, the abdomen tends to expand out like an accordion. And then over time, as this blood meal digests, if the, uh, the food source was an infected rodent, you'll have plague bacteria multiplying within the gut of that flea and up in the esophagus and the foregut. This is a flea here that has uh, digested much of the blood meal, and you see a dark mass in the flea that is, consists of partly digested and coagulated blood, as well as uh, thousands of Y. pestis bacteria. Now, this flea uh, can become blocked, meaning that when it tries to feed, that this bolus of bacteria in blood can prevent it from actually sucking blood. And this flea can become highly agitated and start biting frantically, and in the process, start regurgitating some of this material into the bite. 
This is a prairie dog, which is one of the rodents that is uh, highly susceptible to plague infection. And generally, when plague comes into a prairie dog colony, it will wipe out these animals in a, in a large scale. And one of the things that we do in plague surveillance is we monitor rodent colonies, such as prairie dogs, to, uh, to look for any signs of potential uh, disease in the animals. If you have signs of a die-off, which may be in the form of just animals disappearing, or rodent burrows that show spider webs and so forth in the entrance, that's a good time to collect fleas for the uh, plague testing. Plague outbreaks in prairie dog colonies does occur as epizootic, so that most, if not all, of the animals will be killed in the outbreak. Uh, pet cats are very susceptible to plague infection, much like people. And when a cat is uh, exposed to the disease, either by flea bite or very commonly by eating infected rodents, they will develop symptoms to it, including, in many cases, becoming infected with pneumonic plague. And at that point, a cat can be infectious for humans. They will often have a swollen node or lymph node on the side of the face associated from a, an oral exposure to plague by eating a rodent. Oftentimes, they'll have oral lesions and uh, bloody nasal discharge. And uh, almost virtually all of the human cases of plague where there was primary pneumonic transmission of the disease in the U.S. in recent years have been from cat to humans. During a plague outbreak in rodents, you can have pet cats starting to show up sick or disappearing in an area. And when we have uh, cats dying, uh, one of the things we will do is, again, uh, collect some tissue, such as liver and spleen, blood, sometimes even uh, removing a lymph node for isolating the plague organism. All right, now that we know the cycle between animals and people, what does it do once it enters the body? Once the organism gets underneath the skin, it's picked up and carried to the regional lymph nodes uh, where the uh, infection becomes much more aggressive and accelerates. The organism starts producing a capsule called the F1 that pre prevents phagocytosis. Um, this produces the bubo in the lymph node, the enlarged tender uh, lymph node that's characteristic of that form of disease. Following this, the, the uh, infection disseminates. It gets into the bloodstream and sets up uh, secondary sites, uh, particularly in the lungs. This is a uh, an inguinal bubo uh, in a, a young girl with uh, plague. Uh, this probably occurred because of a flea bite somewhere on the leg. Uh, if the bite occurs on the arm, the axillary lymph nodes tend to um, uh, be involved. Plague is a very serious fulminant disease. Uh, untreated plague has a 60% uh, mortality when it's of the bubonic type. Septicemic and pneumonic plague have mortalities approaching 100% untreated. Antibiotic treatment changes that. If, uh, if antibiotics that are effective are started in time, uh, the mortality can be reduced to about 10%. Uh, the key is in time. Uh, what is in yeah, time? Yeah, too late comes up pretty quick when you're talking about plague. I don't have good data for bubonic plague, but it's fairly well established that if effective treatment is not started within 24 hours of the onset of symptoms with pneumonic plague, the outcome is going to be very poor. Okay. How do people come in contact with the bacteria naturally? Well, Boris, uh, there's a couple of ways that uh, one could contract plague. Uh, exposure to infected fleas is the most uh, likely route uh, of exposure. Uh, so a flea has fed on a, a plague-infested animal uh, and then comes and feeds on you or tries to feed on you. Uh, that's a good way to get plague. Uh, the other way to get plague is to be exposed to the respiratory droplets uh, of an infected animal uh, or of an infected person. <laughs> Once exposure has occurred, there's an incubation period that's two to ten days for bubonic plague, two to three days for pneumonic plague. Um, the different forms of the disease are, are manifest by different signs and symptoms, uh, bubonic plague being manifest mainly by uh, the bubo. Uh, as I mentioned, they, they tend to occur in the area uh, draining the flea bite. As you can see here, this is an axillary lymph node that's become infected probably from a, a flea bite on the, uh, on the chest or abdomen or the arm. Uh, other systemic signs and symptoms occur, fever, chills, headache, uh, overall prostration. All right, how is it, um, or is this how it would be disseminated as a, as a BW agent um, by fleas? Well, Doris, that's, that's um, probably not as crazy as it sounds. Uh, that certainly probably wouldn't be the most efficient way uh, of disseminating plague, but uh, the Japanese, again in Unit 731 in the years leading up to World War II, did uh, attempt to disseminate plague uh, this way. They dropped millions of infected fleas uh, over occupied Manchuria and did start uh, a bubonic plague 
uh, outbreak in, in an area where it hadn't been seen before. Again, today, uh, probably most terrorists or belligerent states out there are going to try to disseminate this uh, via aerosol. That would cause the more deadly form of plague, uh, the pneumonic form. Okay. What would some of the symptoms be, Colonel Byrne? Uh, cough, chest pain, uh, hemoptysis, and severe systemic uh, symptoms. The chest x-ray would show, uh, can show a number of findings. It could show cavitation, Apache bronchi pneumonia, or Frank Lobar consolidation. As we can see on the chest x-ray here, this is uh, virtually opacified. Um, other uh, laboratory data that uh, would be observed, the white count is going to be elevated uh, 20,000 or higher. Uh, the bands are going to be increased. Fiber de degradation products uh, may be identified, indicating uh, the patient uh, may go into uh, DIC. Uh, liver function tests, the AST and the ALT, may be elevated, indicating that there's uh, involvement of the liver. DIC, Ted, describe it. Uh, DIC, Doris, is disseminated intravascular coagulation. Basically, it's a, a clinical state where the clotting system has gone haywire. Uh, and you start to develop micro clots uh, in, in the small blood vessels, typically in the fingers, the toes, uh, et cetera. Um, when you see this uh, in plague, uh, you start to see some of the hallmark findings uh, that are associated with plague. Uh, and here you can see in this uh, shot uh, necrosis of the tips of the fingers uh, in an unfortunate gentleman uh, who contracted the septicemic uh, form uh, of plague. And I think we have another shot uh, that again uh, highlights this devastation. You can see this gentleman's probably going to lose uh, several fingers, uh, maybe the tip of his nose, maybe his lip, because of the disseminated intravascular coagulation associated with septicemic plague. Now, besides clinically, how can you diagnose the plague? Well, diagnostic tests uh, would include uh, staining, a gram stain, or waste and stain of a uh, fluid that ought to be sterile. There are ordinarily plenty of organisms there to see. A lymph node aspirant might reveal uh, the organism. Uh, sputum gram stain uh, may uh, indicate uh, that it's there, the typical uh, bipolar staining, gram-negative conchal bacilli. Uh, obviously, gram stain uh, of a spinal fluid that's positive for these organisms uh, would be a, a serious concern. A gram stain of blood um, can even uh, show organisms. Uh, patients can have uh, tremendous bacteremias during the course of this disease. Uh, once a gram stain has identified an organism, this can be confirmed with a direct fluorescent antibody uh, test that's performed at USAMRID. A polymerase chain reaction can also identify the organism. The F1 antigen that I mentioned can be identified uh, by an ELISA uh, capture assay. Uh, what about cultures? Uh, Yersinia pestis grows up pretty well on most culture medium. Media, the problem is that it grows up a little slowly. It may take two or three days to complete its biochemicals. It wouldn't be surprising uh, to be involved in a case of, of plague and not have the diagnosis uh, absolutely confirmed uh, until you're 48 or 72 hours into a course of treatment. Okay. Now, Ted, you mentioned before that uh, people can get pneumonic plague from respiratory droplets from another person, but does this mean that plague is contagious? Yes, Doris, it does. And in fact, that's a very important point that we need to understand concerning plague. Uh, again, we said earlier in the broadcast that one of the few bits of good news about these biological agents is that they're not contagious person to person in many cases. But this is one of the exceptions. Uh, plague and smallpox, pneumonic plague at least, and smallpox uh, can be uh, spread person to person. So proper precautions uh, are necessary. And in the new terminology uh, of the CDC, uh, that would be droplet precautions that one would utilize. A uh, plague has the potential for person-to-person -person spread, but it tends to be pretty close contact. Uh, and this contact can be limited uh, by appropriate respiratory precautions, and, uh, and the disease can be controlled with prophylactic antibiotics. Uh, it's, it's not nearly as contagious as some of the other organisms that we've talked about uh, earlier today, or nearly as contagious as some of the common viral illnesses, such as influenza or measles, where you can acquire the illness from somebody you haven't even seen. Mm. Well, we have an interview with Dr. Dave Dennis from the CDC in Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, discussing some outbreaks of pneumonic plague and risk factors for them. Let's take a look at the video. The history of uh, pneumonic plague uh, outbreaks uh, with the third pandemic since the beginning of this century um, is interesting. Uh, there were huge outbreaks involving tens of thousands of persons, uh, of person to person pneumonic plague, primary pneumonic plague that occurred in Manchuria in 1910 and 1911, and again, 1920, 21 or so. And that was 
peculiar circumstances where there were people, large numbers of people, crowded into very small spaces, into uh, railroad cars, into small shacks. Um, plague had been brought into these populations by people who were hunting uh, infected marmots for their skin. I think marmot skin hats was uh, something was uh, was popular at that at that time. Not only were the pelts infected, but uh, people skinning it got infection through cuts in their in their skin and uh, developed the plague and then the uh, plague became pneumonic plague and then it rapidly spread uh, person to person. The circumstances that we think that were favorable to it rather than other than just crowding uh, was that it was very cold and very humid and uh, the plague organism is very susceptible to dryness and to heat. And so in a normal circumstances, uh, the plague still is dry, uh, dies very quickly when in the uh, ambient temperature and in, in environment. But in those cold, the humid circumstances in Manchuria during the wintertime, uh, in those crowded conditions, it spread very quickly uh, and was extraordinarily high fatality amongst this group. We don't know uh, everything uh, that we would like about the dynamics of its spread. Uh, in some circumstances, it seems to be able to spread quite easily. In others, uh, it isn't. But we do know that uh, plague pneumonia is so severe and so dramatic that patients are seen early, and once they're hospitalized and put under isolation with respiratory precautions, uh, the transmission uh, stops quite quickly because the organism does not aerosolize, such as measles virus or smallpox virus or tuberculosis, uh, bacteria, and it is only spread by those respiratory dr uh, droplets. So it spreads to persons who are in close contact uh, with someone who is coughing, generally, the organism uh, in the early stages of, uh, of the disease. The native persons are put under uh, isolation with respiratory precautions. Uh, the way to prevent uh, the spread, obviously, is have uh, good surveillance to detect cases in the early stages, uh, to uh, put them uh, quickly in isolation under respiratory precautions, uh, to identify all contacts, and those that had uh, close uh, contact, put them under antibiotic uh, post-exposure uh, prophylaxis with antibiotics, cyclene, uh, chloramphenicol for oral antibiotics. Um, sometimes uh, uh, persons who are allergic to those medications and cannot take them because of aging, however, can be uh, treated with trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole as a uh, preventive. Um, yes, and of course, early treatment of the cases themselves so they uh, uh, can't continue to spread the, uh, the organism. I would think that treatment of a case brings about interruption of transmission within uh, 24 hours in most cases, but perhaps even shorter than that. Well, Russ, uh, Dr. Dennis mentioned uh, several antibiotics, actually, that were useful in the prophylaxis of plague. What would you uh, recommend? Doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days or as long as the exposure lasts. Okay. Now, I assume the treatment of the sick patients is also important in decreasing the spread. Well, that's right, Doris. Uh, treatment of sick patients certainly is important, and uh, the recommended drugs in this case would be streptomycin. Uh, streptomycin would be administered in a dosage of 30 milligrams per kilogram per day. It would be given intramuscularly in two divided doses, and you'd probably want to continue that for at least uh, 10 days. Uh, streptomycin is obviously uh, difficult to procure in this day and age. Acceptable alternatives to streptomycin uh, would include doxycycline. You could give that uh, at a dosage of 200 milligrams uh, initially, and then 100 milligrams Q12 hours, again, for 10 to 14 days. Uh, in those 6% uh, of plague cases that would be expected to develop meningitis, uh, you would want to use chloramphenicol, since uh, that's the only drug that reliably uh, treats Yersinia infections in the central nervous system. Uh, it's important to remember to start treatment very early. It needs to be started within 18 to 24 hours uh, after the onset of symptoms if you uh, stand a, a decent chance of salvaging the patient. Colonel Byrne, uh, maybe you can enlighten us as to whether there are new treatments uh, that one uh, could consider, besides the drugs I've uh, already reviewed. Um, 
Well, consider, considering the limited availability of streptomycin, genomycin is, is usually used uh, initially, and that's not a new drug, obviously. Uh, there's evidence to suggest that the quinolones would be effective. Uh, there's in vitro evidence and there's uh, evidence in laboratory animals. I'm not aware of any human data to support that. Um, there's evidence to indicate that, that the penicillins and the cephalosporins uh, are not effective, and I believe that they're actually contraindicated in the treatment of plague based on uh, certain animal studies that have been done. Okay. What if people were exposed and they don't have symptoms yet? Well, Doris, uh, in that case, I'd use the same treatment that we discussed for healthcare workers, uh, namely doxycycline prophylaxis. Okay. Now, is there a vaccine for plague? There is a plague vaccine. It's licensed in this country. Uh, three shots are administered uh, over uh, a three to six month period. It has uh, an acceptable side effect profile. It's not uh, the easiest vaccine that we have to get, but it's not the worst. Uh, the majority of the patients have some local symptoms and perhaps 10% will experience systemic side effects. You know, I think it's, uh, I'd like to point out here at least, uh, we've heard a lot about anthrax vaccine, and we hear a lot about anthrax be vaccine being the first anti-biological warfare vaccine. Um, and yet, there's this plague vaccine that's been around for a long time, and again, we've used it uh, uh, in Vietnam, et cetera. So the question is, what's up? Well, uh, I think the answer to that question is, we've never thought of the plague vaccine as an anti-biological warfare vaccine. In fact, when we administered that vaccine in Vietnam, it was to protect against endemic bubonic plague, not against biological warfare, pneumonic plague. The vaccine really, uh, as far as animal studies uh, reveal to us, doesn't seem to work against pneumonic plague, against aerosol plague. And I wonder if, Russ, you had any more comments uh, about the vaccine, its availability, uh, and issues like that. Well, outside of the military, the plague vaccine has a very limited market in this country. Uh, there's only a single manufacturer of plague vaccine and the existing uh, stocks of vaccine become outdated uh, before the end of this year. Uh, currently, there are efforts underway to get the new lots of the vaccine licensed. Okay. Now, since the, uh, this organiz organism uh, is contagious, are there any additional decontamination methods that you need to use? Well, Doris, besides uh, strict uh, adherence to droplet precautions for the pneumonic form of plague, uh, you would want to administer antibiotic, uh, antibiotics, obviously, as indicated, and for the first 48 hours of that antibiotic treatment, you would continue these droplet precautions. Uh, if you then subsequently confirm that, in fact, you were dealing with plague, uh, you would continue those droplet precautions uh, until sputum cultures uh, were negative. You have to remember uh, that if someone has recently uh, been exposed uh, and they're not yet, or, and, and the person they were exposed to is not yet coughing, is not yet generating secondary aerosols, uh, then they're probably at very little risk and just soap and water, dilute bleach uh, for decon, et cetera, uh, would be effective. So I think you have to take that into account. Okay. Well, I think most people remember an outbreak of plague in India a few years ago. And as an example of some of the fear of this disease and to emphasize some of the epidemiology information we covered earlier, let's go back to Dr. Dennis and hear about his experiences investigating that outbreak. We were first uh, made aware of an un unusual situation in India in uh, September of 1994 when uh, we had requests for uh, large uh, lots of reagents for the diagnosis of plague. And uh, when we uh, queried the WHO office uh, in India about this, uh, they um, got information from the Ministry of Health that there was a suspected outbreak of plague occurring in, uh, in West Central uh, India. It was the worst case scenario from a public health standpoint in uh, Surat. It was, a, it was a city of about two million people, uh, many living uh, uh, on the edge of the poverty, uh, people who were transient coming in from the rural areas to find work and living in, in uh, uh, slum areas, uh, shanty towns, um, and extraordinarily poor sanitary uh, uh, and, and hygienic measures in place. The garbage was littering the streets. So the rat population undoubtedly exceeded the human population. Uh, and when the word got out that a plague was occurring and that the government was putting into place plague control measures, and they were very efficient at plague control measures. I mean, they could mobilize large numbers of people to go in to identify people who had fever and hospitalize them to uh, treat people with antibiotics, to provide antibiotics for prophylaxis, to uh, put up flea uh, suppression measures. They were quite good at that. But anyway, when the word went out that they suspected plague, people 
still had a memory of the outbreak of plague that occurred in the 30s and the 40s and in the early 50s, terrorized the population. And of course, they wanted the exodus. And tens of thousands of people anyway, and in the press it was reported hundreds of thousands of people left the uh, city of Surat and spread themselves out in other areas of India. Uh, the panic was so great that physicians and nurses and other healthcare workers uh, deserted their posts. And uh, so that further uh, decreased the confidence in the public that, that the government was able to manage the situation. Uh, fortunately, we have no evidence that there was spread of plague to other large cities or other areas in which there was then human to human transmission. We did identify one uh, person in Delhi with a confirmed human plague from a laboratory standpoint who had been in uh, living in rural Maharashtra and had traveled to uh, Delhi at the time of being, he was incubating the disease, but there was no secondary spread, of course, in this person that was bubonic plague. I don't think there was any way to uh, really uh, determine quickly uh, what the evolution of the outbreak uh, was. And uh, it certainly uh, could have been an a, um, an unnatural event, as far as we know, uh, especially uh, the situation in Surat, where there was mnemonic plague cases. Um, what happened was there was an explosion over uh, a, f a period of a few days of about um, 100 cases of severe uh, pneumonia with uh, respiratory insufficiency, uh, hemoptysis, and rapid death, and the uh, high fatality in persons who weren't treated quickly in fact, uh, there was about uh, 40 deaths amongst those 100 cases that had occurred in those first few days. Uh, this, the thing that was unusual about it was there had been no antecedent plague in Surat uh, for decades. There was no known uh, cycling of plague in the rodents and their fleas in the city. There had been no reports of rat die-off in Surat in that city. Uh, there were no bubonic plague cases, uh, which you would expect. Uh, it would be uh, very much greater in number than the mnemonic plague cases and the perceived mnemonic cases. Uh, that was not in place. So, I mean, um, in actuality, it makes a very good scenario for an accidental or a, or a, uh, a uh, determined uh, event. Uh, we still don't know uh, really what happened, but uh, the best conjecture at that time was that someone uh, had come in from the area where they had reported the outbreak of bubonic plague in the countryside into Surat at the time that they're incubating the disease, developed secondary pneumonic plague, and then there was a burst of cases uh, arising from exposure to that and secondary cases accounting for those uh, uh, pneumonic plague cases and deaths that occurred in the city, and then it quickly died out and uh, without evidence of there being rat plague or bubonic plague cases occurring there. What is needed to respond to a plague case or a plague uh, cluster of cases or an outbreak is a multidisciplinary team, uh, in effect, a SWAT team. And that really is what was needed in India. You know, they needed a team of epidemiologists who understood plague, including clinicians who could uh, determine whether or not the clinical signs and symptoms really were compatible with plague. Uh, they needed uh, microbiologists that had a mobile uh, laboratory at least to have the reagents and to have the uh, materials to do a presumptive uh, diagnosis of plague. Uh, and they needed to have the entomologists and the zoologists, the ecologists that understood uh, the natural cycle of plague and how it could have spread to the human population. And if they'd had a team of those people, they could have gone in and made sense out of that outbreak in Surat in 24, 36, 48 hours. But they missed the boat. Now, as I recall, there was a lot of international fear that this plague could have spread around the world. Colonel Byrne? Well, the severe form and nature of the disease requires uh, effective, uh, focused containment uh, measures. Uh, there is panic associated with it, and, and justifiably so. Uh, international uh, regulations allow a uh, quarantine uh, of up to six days of individuals suspected of having a significant exposure to mnemonic plague. 
And that was the justification behind the cancellation of flights and holding planes on the runway and uh, stuff like that. The key point is significant exposure. Uh, that requires uh, household contact uh, or possibly workplace contact or face-to-face -face contact like you and me right now. Mm -hmm. Certainly a lot of these issues uh, that we're talking about here call into mind the importance of epidemiolog epidemiology and of conducting a good epidemiologic investigation as we, as we talked about earlier on the show. All right. Well, why don't we move on to another bacterial agent, uh, the one that causes tularemia. Okay. Tularemia, Doris, is a uh, disease uh, that's primarily zoonotic in nature. It's a disease of rabbits, hares, ground squirrels, muskrats, uh, beavers, uh, and the like. Uh, uh, as a disease of rabbits, it's often known as rabbit fever. It's transmitted uh, from animal to animal or from animal uh, to person, uh, sometimes by the bite uh, of uh, various vectors, uh, the deer fly, for example. And in that sense, it's often referred to as deer fly fever. Uh, the disease tularemia is caused by infection with the gram-negative cacobacillary organism, Francisella tularensis. Tularemia is uh, interesting in that it's found naturally only in the northern hemisphere. All right, what are the ways people are infected? Well, uh, there are several ways uh, that one could be infected. Uh, one way uh, is uh, through inoculation of the skin or of the mucous membranes uh, by the blood and tissue fluids of infected animals. So if I skinned muskrats uh, as a uh, hobby uh, or for a living, uh, that would be a good way to contract uh, tularemia. Uh, another way is, again, as I stated earlier, by the bite of an infected deer fly, an infected mosquito, an infected tick. Uh, rabbit hunters uh, are at particular risk. So if you want to get tularemia, uh, that's a good way to do it, be a rabbit hunter. Uh, less commonly, uh, infections can occur by inhaling the contaminated dusts uh, uh, of areas where animals uh, have frequented, uh, by ingesting contaminated uh, food or water, uh, and the like. The organism uh, uh, is uh, rather stable. It can remain viable uh, for weeks uh, in water, in soil, or in the carcasses of those animals that we've was, does the stability make it a good BW candidate? I'll let uh, Colonel Byrne answer that. The stability makes it a good BW candidate, uh, along with the fact that it forms aerosols naturally, and then it only takes one to ten organisms to initiate infection. The Japanese uh, studied uh, Francella tularensis at Unit 731, and the United States weaponized uh, this organism in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Is the disease fatal? Well, Doris, we used to consider tularemia a lethal agent back when we had an offensive biological warfare program. I think nowadays, uh, with modern medicine, modern uh, standards of care, good antibiotics, most of us would consider tularemia uh, an incapacitating agent. Most uh, naturally acquired cases uh, uh, in the 1990s have a fatality rate uh, of only 5 to 10 percent actually without treatment. Uh, if you were doing biological warfare, you may be able to, s to uh, select out a more virulent strain, and it may be a little higher than that, especially given that what you're going to see uh, in biological warfare or terrorism, terrorism would be uh, primarily the septicemic form of the disease. But with appropriate antibiotic treatment, uh, basically the case fatality rate should be zero. Okay, so, but if a patient is exposed, what do they experience? Colonel Byrne, I don't, you can probably answer that. You may have seen more tularemia than I have. Well, there's an incubation period of, uh, that can range from one to 14 days. It's usually um, three to five days. Uh, then the clinical presentation depends uh, on how the infection was initiated. Uh, the most common form is the ulcer glandular form, and that uh, produces an ulcer at the site of inoculation. Uh, also associated with this are regional lymphadenopathy and systemic symptoms uh, such as fever, uh, malaise, uh, chills, and so on. Mm -hmm. I think we have a case here uh, that we can uh, show you, get, give you a feel for what this looks like. Uh, and in this case, uh, there was a woman who was treated by my partner, George Christopher, at Scott Air Force Base. Uh, this woman was apparently bitten by a tick, uh, and she came in complaining of a two-day history of fever and debilitating malaise. And you can see uh, the ulcer that has formed at the site of a tick bite uh, on her scalp. Uh, she was treated. She did fine. She lived happily ever after. Uh, if the ulcer was not present, uh, then you would basically have a syndrome that we call glandular tularemia. There's also a syndrome known as pharyngeal tularemia, and there's an oculoglandular tularemia. And basically the only difference is that there the conjunctiva uh, is the portal uh, of infection. All of these uh, syndromes can progress to the systemic form of the disease, which we often refer to as typhoidal tularemia. That can also result directly uh, after the ingestion or the inhalation of Francisella tularensis. Okay, so which is the most likely form in a, in a, a BW attack? Well, assuming uh, a biological warfare attack mm -hmm. uh, would probably be that the bad guy out there would aerosolize this stuff, we would inhale it, and the form of the disease we would get would primarily be typhoidal tularemia. And typhoidal tularemia presents with fever, uh, prostate, 
frustration, weight loss. Um, you may have respiratory involvement with some substernal discomfort and uh, a, a non-productive cough. Uh, the pneumonic involvement is not always present, though, even after an inhalational exposure. Here is uh, an example uh, of a good pneumonic uh, uh, tularemia case, and you can see the, the infiltrates on chest x-ray. Uh, respiratory symptoms sometimes may be the predominant manifestation uh, of illness, though. Okay. Uh, Colonel Werner, are there any other ways to diagnose tularemia? Well, unlike plague, there are usually not a lot of organisms to see on stain. So staining sputum or lymph nodes is usually not very helpful. Um, the organism uh, can be cultured, but it's difficult because it has specific growth requirements, and it's also a little bit dangerous to work with. There have been a lot of laboratory outbreaks of tularemia and people who work in this organism. Mm -hmm. The laboratory ought to be notified if uh, you suspect tularemia so they can uh, um, institute appropriate BL3 containment measures. The diagnosis is usually established uh, by acute and convalescent to antibody determination um, in serum. Uh, ordinarily, these are agglutination tests. Uh, there's also uh, an ELISA available. Polymerase chain reaction has also been uh, used. If organisms are identified in uh, tissue, uh, there's an indirect fluorescent antibody that's used at UCM RID that can confirm the diagnosis of tularemia. All right. Well, since it's not usually fatal, do you really need to treat the disease? Well, Doris, you do. Uh, first of all, it can be fatal. And again, uh, belligerents out there could pick an especially virulent strain uh, that can be fatal up to 30% of the time. And even if it's not fatal, it certainly uh, is not a pleasant disease. People can get pretty sick from tularemia. We usually consider it an incapacitating agent, but again, uh, not a pleasant disease if you get it. Both streptomycin uh, and genomycin are effective in treatment, so we have good, relatively inexpensive therapy. Uh, and certainly I would use that if I had a case uh, of tularemia. Uh, as you can see here, the recommended therapeutic regimen would be streptomycin one gram every 12 hours, uh, given intramuscularly over a 10 to 14 day period. Uh, and alternatively, one could use genomycin. That would be given uh, three to five milligrams per kilogram per day uh, intravenously, uh, again, for a 10 to 14 day period. Uh, tetracycline and chloramphenicol uh, can be effective, uh, but they're associated uh, probably with a higher relapse rate than the immunoglycosides. Okay. Colonel Byrne, what about contagion with this agent? I mean, do health care providers really need to worry? Uh, although laboratory infections are a, a real problem, uh, human to human uh, transmission is, is very unusual, and uh, standard uh, precautions with uh, respect to secretions are all that is necessary um, to prevent transmission in the healthcare setting. Okay, now if you've been exposed, is there anything you can take to prevent infection? Well, Doris, antibiotics are very effective uh, in preventing disease after aerosol exposure. We know that from a lot of animal data. A two-week course of tetracycline or doxycycline uh, is what we would recommend. And you can see here the uh, recommended regimen with respect to doxycycline. It would be 100 milligrams orally uh, every 12 hours for a two-week period. Okay. Is there a vaccine? A live attenuated vaccine is available as an IND product. It works quite well in preventing laboratory infections uh, and in uh, preventing infection uh, uh, by aerosolization uh, in human volunteers in old studies. Uh, as with most vaccines, all vaccines that I know of, the protection can be overwhelmed by a, a very high inoculum of organisms. At present, the vaccine is only used in, in laboratory workers. The vaccine has, has an interesting history, as you're aware. Uh, right, right. The vaccine, like, the, the vaccine actually uh, was given to us in 1955 at the very height of the Cold War uh, by the Soviet Union. It came from their Gamalia Research Institute, and we refer to it as the Gamalia strain. Uh, so kind of interesting that at, at the exact height of the Cold War, we would get this from the Soviets. Exactly. Well, I'll tell you what, let's start on our last disease of the day, brucellosis. And before we get started, I'd like to welcome our last guest expert for today, Colonel David Hoover. Uh, Colonel Hoover is the scientific coordinator for the Brucella vaccine program at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. Uh, Colonel Hoover, can you describe to us some of the background of brucellosis? Well, brucellosis actually has a long history of association with the military. It was uh, first described in 1861 by Marston on, in British troops who were stationed on the island of Malta. And then studies in the late 1800s by Bruce and Hughes defined the clinical spectrum. It's actually quite prevalent in the developing world, but uh, there are less than 100 cases per year in the United States. It's an important cause of abortion in large animals, especially large food animals and is naturally acquired by contact with infected animals or their products. Uh, there are actually six recognized species of brucella. Four of these are pathogenic for humans. Uh, brucella melitensis infects sheep and goats and is the most virulent for humans, followed very closely by brucella suis, which is 
uh, a pathogen of uh, swine. Brucella abortus is the primary cause of infection in cattle and Brucella canis in dogs. You know, there are some pretty interesting ways in, what, in, in which one can become infected uh, with the brucellae. As Colonel uh, Hoover uh, stated, uh, these are common pathogens of certain farm animals. And so if one were a rancher or worked in the animal husbandry industry, for example, uh, that would be a good way to contract brucellosis. Brucellosis is essentially a venereal disease uh, of animals. It's present in the gynecologic tract of, uh, of cattle, of sheep. Uh, and of goats. And so if you were a rancher assisting in the delivery, for example, mm -hmm. of a pregnant cow, uh, and you weren't wearing gloves or you had a tear in your glove, you had a tear in your skin, uh, that would be a good way to inoculate oneself uh, with brucellosis. Um, it's present in the milk uh, of many of these animals as well, brucellosis is. And so, uh, for example, on the Mexican border, uh, goat's milk cheese is a, uh, a common delicacy, and it's often unpasteurized. So to go down to the Mexican border in South Texas, for example, and sample the unpasteurized goat's milk cheese, a good way to get Brucella melatensis uh, infection. Uh, in South Texas, uh, they're fond of hunting javelina, these wild boars uh, that are found in far South Texas. And those are good animals uh, to transmit uh, Brucella suis uh, infection. And finally, uh, in Saudi Arabia, where brucellosis is very common, there's a very interesting habit uh, shepherds in Saudi Arabia, as part of their payment, when they deliver their sheep to market, the sheep are slaughtered and they're given hot right out of the animal the caudate lobe of the liver. And it's customary and it's considered a delicacy to eat that raw caudate lobe of the liver. And a lot of brucellosis cases emanate from that uh, very interesting practice. So um, this uh, is a disease uh, uh, that's highly infectious by aerosol. Um, but it's got a long and variable incubation period. Mm -hmm. So that the, the fact that it's highly infectious makes it um, somewhat attractive as a biological weapon, but the fact that its incubation period is so long and so mm -hmm. variable detracts somewhat from that. Uh, okay. Dr. Hoover, uh, tell us what a typical case of brucellosis looks like. Well, it's a little hard to define a typical case because of this variability in, uh, in presentation, but you, brucella can either present as a, an acute febrile illness with fever and sweats, headache, uh, arthralgias, and general malaise. And, and these kinds of symptoms can go on for weeks or months until the disease is diagnosed. Or it actually can present as a more insidious illness with anorexia, weight loss, difficulty concentrating, and depression. Uh, about a third of patients uh, develop spread to the bones and joints. And in younger people, sacroiliitis is the most common uh, joint infection. And uh, this uh, is typically a non-destructive infection. But in older patients, as uh, seen in this uh, photo here, uh, you can get vertebral osteomyelitis. And here the disease starts in the intervert intervertebral disc and spreads to the uh, adjacent vertebrae. Uh, in addition, you can get uh, chronic genital urinary tract infection, particularly epididymitis. And you can also get meningitis or endocarditis, which are the main causes of fatality, although fortunately these are very rare. You know, I've actually seen a case of brucellosis. Before I uh, uh, joined the Army, I worked for a while with the Public Health Service up in Barrow, Alaska, this remote Eskimo mm -hmm. village. And uh, uh, we had a gentleman come in with, uh, and, and was ultimately uh, diagnosed as having brucellosis. And he had uh, hunted a polar bear and had eaten raw polar bear meat. And we mm -hmm. presumed that that was uh, the source of his brucellosis, although that's not the most typical animal to harbor uh, that disease. But I can tell you from experience, a very difficult disease to diagnose. It took us uh, several weeks before we finally came up with the proper diagnosis uh, of brucellosis. Uh, in that case. Those patients uh, who have respiratory symptomatology often have normal chest x-rays. Uh, some patients have hepatosplenomegaly, some patients don't. Uh, so you can see it's tough to diagnose. For, for those patients who do have joint involvement, uh, CAT scans, MRI scans, plain radiographs, bone scans may be helpful. But again, very tough disease uh, sometimes to diagnose. So how do you confirm uh, that it's brucella causing all the symptoms? Well, uh, culture is actually the, uh, the most reliable uh, test, either uh, culture of blood or uh, suspected infected body fluids. And although it's, it's considered a slow-growing organism, 95% uh, of, of those cultures that will become positive become positive in seven days. Uh, it's uh, still recommended to hold cultures for, for up to two months if you really suspect the disease. And uh, culture of bone marrow can increase the yield substantially over uh, blood culture alone. Uh, you should warn the laboratory, however, not to, sub, not to subculture the bacterium 
uh, unless they have BL3 capability, since this is actually one of the most common causes of laboratory infections. Most cases are actually diagnosed by uh, serology. The gold standard is a uh, tube agglutination test. You have to worry about cross-reactions with uh, Francisella tularensis and uh, patients who have cholera or vaccinated with cholera. Uh, PCR is actually useful for speciation, but uh, it's not very useful clinically at this point. Well, it sounds as if this could be a very prolonged illness. I mean, can it be treated? Well, Doris, it's actually not too difficult to treat. There's some good news and there's some bad news attendant uh, with treatment. The good news is uh, that the treatment regimen is the, or the, the standard regimen, there are actually several regimens one could use, but the most uh, uh, commonly recommended regimen is doxycycline uh, plus rifampin. And the good news here is that both of those can be given orally and both of those can be given once a day. So I can give you one pill a day of doxycycline, 200 milligrams, uh, one dose a day of rifampin, 600 to 900 milligrams, uh, and again, pretty easy uh, to administer that therapy. The bad news is, is that you need to continue therapy for six weeks. And the literature is full of cases uh, of relapsing brucellosis mm -hmm. where the clinician didn't treat uh, the patient for a long enough period of time or where the patient stopped uh, taking uh, the antibiotics. So. What do you do for severe disease? Well, you might want to add an aminoglycoside like uh, genomycin. And for endocarditis, you should certainly consider valve replacement uh, early in the infection. You have to remember that you don't really need to isolate these patients since it's not transmitted person to person. Okay. Is there a vaccine available? Well, Doris, there's a great veterinary vaccine. In fact, there are a couple of great veterinary vaccines available, and those vaccines have greatly decreased the number of cases in animals, and that's led to a decrease in the cases of human brucellosis. Uh, it's still important to emphasize, though, that you need to avoid uh, the consumption of unpasteurized milk and cheese, the goat's milk, a scenario that I alluded to earlier. Uh, and it's important to know or to realize out there that there is no human vaccine uh, currently available. But studies are going on. Yes, we do have some promising animal studies going on, but vaccine is a few years away for sure. All right. Well, that about covers the bacterial agents. And I guess then it's time for our local activity number two. A recent vote of no confidence has led to parliamentary elections in Krasnovia. Control now lies in the hands of the hardliners, who immediately after assuming power, signed a mutual defense pact with Saracen and withdrew support for UN peacekeeping forces. Elite Krasnovian special forces plus three parachute infantry regiments have been deployed to Saracen, despite vigorous US and UN protests. In response, the United States has moved the 18th Airborne Corps to staging facilities in Europe. You are a medic serving with the 28th Combat Support Hospital. The 28th currently occupies the old U.S. Air Base at Zweibrücken, Germany. In addition to the heavy workload and anxiety associated with site preparation, you are burdened by an unusually high number of sick call patients from your own unit presenting during the past 48 hours. Most of these patients have complained of fever, headache, fatigue, and cough. Okay, try to take nice deep breaths for me. Yesterday, your partner wrote 43 azithromycin prescriptions for what he assumed to be walking pneumonia. As you come on duty, you're surprised to see that half of those patients are back and that many new ones have arrived. What is going on? Hey, Sergeant Walker. Sergeant Walker, what, 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 who are all these soldiers? Hey, sir, it's been like this all night long. We had about 20, 30 patients all night, not including these ones we got here. They're all complaining of the same thing. Headache, fatigue, tightness in the chest, uh, and a little bit of nausea. Yeah. I don't know what else we can do with it. We got vital signs. All right, all right. Who's, who's sick us? Well, he's sick, but we can start over here trying to get some okay. vital signs from okay. these folks over here. Uh, all right. Got a um, temperature of... on her. It's about a one, 101. Okay. All right. What's bothering you? I'm really hot. My chest hurts. Okay. All right. All right. Let me take a listen to you. Okay, take, a, take a real deep breath. Okay, deep breath. Okay. Um, you guys get x-rays in any of these? Try, try to get some x-rays uh, late last night, but the x-ray machine okay. was down. All right. We'll try and get them again. I can right. see yeah, one she doesn't, she, down. Doesn't, she doesn't sound very bad. I don't okay. hear any wheezing or anything. Right. Um, who's, who's next? Okay, well, we can go right here. Okay. This guy right. here. Uh, okay. Same thing. <coughs> Tightness in the okay. chest. Right. Been coughing. Headaches. Right. What, what's bothering you? It's tired all the time. I feel like I got the flu. I'm coughing. Right. Just right. Let me take a, Let me take a listen to you. Take a deep breath. Just, just breathe normal now. 
I don't hear any uh, rails or wheezing. <coughs> you got somebody else? Uh, well, yeah, this one over here, he's been pretty sick. Okay, what's bothering same, you? Same thing with this guy. What's bothering you? Okay, these all, are these folks in the same unit? Same unit, sir. Okay. Same unit. All right, well, let me They all listen. came in. Can you sit up a little bit? Okay, take a deep breath. Okay, deep breath. Okay. Hey, Sergeant Walker, you need to send somebody down to uh, X ray. Okay. You got to go right now. Yes, you put it. I need you to go down to X ray right now and get that portable down here ASAP, okay? Go, sir. Go get it. Okay, uh, while we're waiting, let's get a CBC. Um, it's all sides on some of these soldiers. Too. Sure. A few hours later, an hysterical soldier runs in screaming that he just found his buddy dead in his bunk. The x-rays you requested that morning finally oh, arrived. Oh my. Specialist, I need to check these 558s. There's too many similarities here. Have you noticed the vital signs? Everybody's got a, over 101 temperature, 102 temperature. They're all complaining about chest. Oh. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is, where you guys head? this is the MT one. Um, what, what are you guys doing here? I'm Lieutenant Colonel Messon. 257 yes, Company. Yeah, I'm Colonel Lancer from the same company. We're, we're dentists. We just arrived here and we just, yes. we're looking around. We wanted to see what was what was going on. Boy, you're okay. busy here. Well, we've got something going on here and I'm not quite sure what it is yet. Well, we noticed a lot of spraying going on outside. It's truck driving around spraying something and we're a little concerned. Yeah, we're those. thinking ticks here. We're thinking maybe we need some oh. tick-borne encephalitis vaccine. Well, I don't know anything about that. My whole EMT is loaded with patients. I've got some serious problems here, okay? And uh, you guys may have walked into something. Uh, we may have to call a quarantine. As a matter of fact, you're quarantined right now. Well, well, Maybe we have to get back to I've got tired soldiers. Listen, I've, got, uh, get I've got radios. I've got landlines. Uh, we've got a real mess on our hands. I've got one medical doctor. I've got uh, 20 patients out here. Uh, why don't you guys give me a hand and uh, a dentist? Sure, you, you sure we we have to be quarantined? You're sure we have to be quarantined? Oh, well, I think so, until we get to the bottom of this. Why don't you guys just give me a hand and uh, take that, you take these half over here, and Doc, you take those half. Well, we have to, well, we have to. Sure, we I mean, something. We'd I've got yeah, medics working know. with them, and uh, they'll give you a heads up as to what they're seeing, but I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of high fever here, 101, 102. Uh, there's a lot of uh, respiratory distress, or at least they're complaining about tightness in their chest. Uh, nobody's come back. I, I've listened to a couple of tests myself. I haven't really heard much activity. Uh, they just feel loud. They just, I think you just help me out. Okay, well, pretty frightening scenario, I think you'll all agree. Uh, what I want to do is very quickly review some of these questions, and then we'll take it uh, back to Doris, and we'll take some more questions from the studio audience. So, first question. Um, you saw that the... Uh, physician who had been on the day before had started a lot of people on azithromycin therapy, thinking that initially these may have been cases of walking pneumonia. What do you think about that? Would you continue the azithromycin at this point? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd certainly consider uh, or reconsider the antibiotic choice based on the fact that I've got so many troops coming back who are sicker on the okay. therapy and and I'd be rethinking my initial diagnosis. Good, good. And that's an important piece of epidemiology uh, that you allude to. You need to take into account what's going on here. If it doesn't fit what you expect, uh, these patients are starting to get sicker than you would expect the average case of walking pneumonia to be. I think you need to reconsider your diagnosis. So uh, initially, I don't have any problem with this diagnosis. But now that patients are coming in sicker, uh, I think you can see that you've got to rethink your diagnosis. Um, any tests you would want to do? Is it important to do any tests? Of course it is. What kind of tests would you want to do uh, in some of these patients? Well, again, you know, at this stage of the game, you're rethinking the diagnosis and uh, uh, gathering more data, including initial vital signs, 
Uh, you already, they already mentioned chest x-ray uh, in these patients who are having significant respiratory symptoms. Uh, getting some initial blood work to include culture, maybe a gram stain if you have the facilities to do that, and uh, some CBCs, things of that nature. Good. I agree with all those. Now, in the, in the case of blood cultures, obviously it's going to take a couple days to get useful information out of blood culture, but a chest x-ray ought to give you some useful information right up front. And I painted a pretty realistic scenario here, you know, the x-ray machine's down, et cetera, et cetera, but I think it's very incumbent upon you to press for that diagnostic information that you need. So you eventually got that chest x-ray, and what did you see on that chest x-ray? There is a uh, widening of the mediastinum, which right. clearly indicates that it's probably anthrax. Absolutely. So widened mediastinum almost has to be anthrax. And the teaching point here is there isn't too much in the world of human medicine uh, that produces a widened mediastinum like that. There's not too much that causes hemorrhagic mediastinitis. And in fact, the only battlefield-relevant injury I can think of other than anthrax is a bullet hole through the mediastinum. So if I have patients with chest x-rays like that, and I turn them over and there's no bullet hole there, they must have uh, inhalational anthrax. So pretty easy diagnosis to confirm in this uh, particular patient. Now, I think you all realize this guy is probably not going to do very well. But your job uh, as clinicians is not necessarily to save that index case, but rather to very rapidly learn from that index case and use that knowledge uh, to helpfully save uh, a lot of other people. Now, the issue came up about quarantine for these two dentists who entered the picture. Anyone agree with that, disagree with that? Would you quarantine these dentists? You know, that was, uh, I think, overreacting. Since uh, the diagnosis was made of okay. anthrax, then since it's not person-to-person -person transmission, you wouldn't need to do that. Good, good. And if this were an unknown, you might approach it differently. For example, if uh, pneumonic plague was still high in the differential diagnosis, I might think a little bit differently, although even with that, uh, these guys just stumbled in. They really haven't uh, had time to be coughed on. Uh, chances are that even with pneumonic plague, they probably wouldn't need to be quarantined. But with anthrax, uh, which doesn't have the possibility of person-to-person -person, uh, transmission. Certainly, those people don't need to be quarantined. Uh, good. Okay. What do you want to do for these ill patients, these patients who are starting to clutter up your uh, treatment facility, who are coughing, who are febrile, who are ill? Anybody have any advice regarding therapy? Can't leave. Well, if you have enough antibiotics, you could try to start them all on antibiotics. Okay. And then if you have the, the vaccine, that you would also want to start them on the vaccine. To good to pick up any of the, the latent spores that might still be in any of the individuals. Good, good. So this is a triage issue, and we've said uh, throughout this course already that if you wait until patients are symptomatic to treat them, uh, chances are they're not going to do well. So many of these people under certain circumstances might be categorized or triaged as expectant. But on the other hand, if your resources permit, it would certainly be reasonable to try to treat those people uh, with antibiotics. Now, what about those people who are not yet ill, patients who may not yet have shown up at your treatment facility, but who were in the same geographic area as these sick patients. Dr. Pollan. You would still want to start them on antibiotic treatment, and if they haven't been vaccinated, to start them on the vaccination Good. regime. Excellent, excellent. So in this case, the antibiotics could be oral, uh, and you would be giving them as prophylaxis rather than as treatment. We discussed uh, the dosages, et cetera, uh, throughout the course. And for those of you students out there in television land, if you need the dosages, uh, they're in your little blue books. In fact, that's why military BDUs have these hip pockets there to hold uh, our little blue books. So you would look that up. Uh, and again, good prophylactic uh, regimens are available, and certainly they would need to be coupled uh, ultimately with vaccination. Well, you guys have done great, uh, and I think there's, again, no sense uh, trying to test you any further. So